United States submarine base at Key West, Florida. A dispatch that quoted President Truman's press secretary, Charles Ross, as saying that President Truman has no knowledge of any secret project by this government that would give substance to the existence of such objects. Ross also said that both the Air Force and the Navy deny that such objects exist. Hi. Hi. The dogs have a lot to say as well. I know. I immediately start barking the second we hit record. I know. They were silent this whole time and then they mm-hmm. waited. And they just want to play. They want to be known. They want to be heard. Yeah. And hey, if that settles your anxiety to once again prove that Bear is fine, then yeah, that's yeah. what happens. Yeah. Well, those were Puffin's barks, but um, Bear is actively pissing Puffin off. Uh, so that's how you know he's fine. Yeah. He's totally fine. Mm-hmm. Um. Hey, what's up? My name is Noelle, and I am the person who has to not only go onto Google Maps and see what the parking situation is like of the place we're about to go to, but I'm also looking at the menu in advance. Uh, And I'm Chelsea. I will pay for parking, and I will park very far away if it means that my parking situation is easier on me emotionally mm, yeah so that makes sense um i feel like you and i are in the same boat of resentment based on what we've both gone through with this episode um yeah i guess let's let me go ahead and start this off with um an apology <laughs> let me go ahead and start this episode off with an apology to because- me specifically because this was fucking hard what i say to you in you. text you cannot say live on these record <laughs> pre-recorded episodes. I all I'm going to say is, well, you know, no, I'm going to I'm going to say it bluntly like we have hinted to doing this episode in the past mm-hmm. based off of um one-sided internet lore <laughs> and you know, tis the plight of being a person online and and um like i don't know honestly i do know it was um just looking for any sort of solace looking for any sort of positivity looking for anything good and then finding a few like practitioners on their corner of the internet that are Mm -hmm. like no like this is for sure 100 not problematic and totally our own thing and i was like oh my god you guys We found it. Mm -hmm. We have found it miraculously. After all this time of America being a country, it took us two freaking crayon eaters to figure out the one thing that America has done that is not tied to problematic histories. Wow. Let's talk about it. Let's let's dig into it. Let's learn about it. Let's appreciate it and put it on a pedestal and tell everyone how great it is to have finally found a piece of American history that is not problematic. And oh, how stupid and naive we are. Because sure as fucking shit, bitch. What? (laughs) I went through, um, so what I got caught in was the TikToks that were like, Mm -hmm. Here's something in the forest. No, you didn't. Fear a rap mm-hmm. tap tapping on your window. No, you yeah. didn't. And but I was don't like, whistle outside. Yeah, and I was bit bopping along. I'm like, no, you didn't. No, uh-huh. you didn't. And then I go to find literally anything on the internet outside of TikTok that talks about that. And there were tumbleweeds in my home. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was nothing. So I so- worked very hard to find stuff that could be interesting but i think in the end noel people are going to find out probably what they did with the utah lore episode was that shit's just usually sad sad it's sad so let me go ahead <clears throat> blah, blah, blah. let me go ahead and start this off by speaking some truths um that need to be acknowledged mm-hmm. the appalachian regions 26.3 million residents live in parts of Alabama, Georgia, Kentucky, Maryland, Mississippi, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, and all of West Virginia. The original Appalachians were obviously natives. The Sawney, Choctaw, and the Creek, and most notably the biggest group, the Cherokee. A lot of native beliefs 
ties to the land and nature. The Cherokee belief specifically is that they were created to live and tend to that land, like point blank. Most Cherokee were successful farmers. Women in the Cherokee tribes held a lot of autonomy. They typically had control of the corn crop, meaning they had economic control of the main staple agricultural item. And this gave them a lot of power and not just autonomy. Older women held spots on councils. Men lived in the households of their wives. And a man's heirs were not his own children, but his sisters. Hell yeah. I know. Of course, this all began to change as European colonialists or colonizers came to the area. Another thing to know about Southern Indian tribes, when they went to, quote, war, it wasn't as we see it. Europeans go to war to conquer, expand their kingdoms, or inflict their own religion or ideology upon those they're at war with. The tribes went to war to avenge the death of family, period. The Cherokees saw people as mainly relatives or enemies, but tradition would allow for outsiders to be taken into the tribes. Captives taken into battle would be adopted into clans, as well as slaves who had escaped into the Appalachian region. In the 1730s, colonials, colonizers, if you will, Mm -hmm. started coming to the South this time, and they were mainly Germans, English, Welsh, and the vast majority being those from the northern coast of Ireland, specifically the Scotch-Irish, which is different than the Irish. Let me point that out. And this was mainly due to famine um, caused by the punishment and abuses of England. There are two trickle down thought. colonialism. Yeah, trickle down colonialism gets mm-hmm. you every time. There are two trains of thought here. Number one, that they were unwelcomed by the New England settlers, which made them push into the West, and the West at that time just being the woods and mountains of the Appalachia. I've heard this or, before because they were Catholic. Yeah. Well, protestant specifically with the um scotch irish the irish were catholic so Mm, you're right the fun thing about talking about this is like you have to kind of know irish lore and like ireland was an area that was um obviously affected by apartheid and um colonialism in itself and and Mm -hmm. um colonization i mean and the the king of England put Scottish, he, he gave apartheid land to the Scottish people in Northern Ireland because he hated the Irish so much. He thought, if I move like my most rowdy people, the Scottish, to this, if I offer them land for free given by apartheid, which is taking from the people and redistributing mm-hmm. um, based off of uh, race, creed, etc., cetera, um, this will be another like cap on um, the Irish. And so in Northern Ireland, um, I'm blanking on the name of the city. It begins with an A. All of these Scotch people came um, from this decree from the King of England. And some of them began to like um, assimilate and they are referred to historically as Scotch Irish. Um, And it's very different from um, Irish. Hmm. Um, The the Scotch Irish, they were mostly Protestant, not Catholics like the Irish were. Because they were, um, yeah. So, um, yeah. (laughs) So anyway, um, so that, that they were, but again, they would still be unwelcomed by the new England settlers or two that Quakers had recruited the Scott Irish because they needed people who weren't afraid of war to fight the natives. Oh, uh because Quakers like, weren't big you know what i mean you you know you know how like religions find loopholes Um, right and because as is true with the entire american story if you couldn't put it together by the beginning of this this land was occupied already by natives fighting went on for over 20 years and there are two quotes i want to mention about this time one is from a statesman named james logan in 1730 he writes quote 
The settlement of five families from Ireland, referencing Scotch-Irish, give me more trouble than 50 of any other people. Or another one where he says, quote, the natives, I changed what he really said there, themselves are alarmed at the swarms of strangers, and we are afraid of a breach between them, for the Irish, Scotch-Irish, are very rough to them. Yeah, I th- thinking that like the Scottish people are less uppity than the Irish people is very wild to me because I have heard myths of these peoples and they are all notoriously notoriously uppity, if you will. Like I wouldn't I, go to a I wouldn't be like, oh, I'm going to go to a Scottish bar and just be, observe while drinking water. That's not what I would assume. And I wouldn't assume the same out of an Irish bar. And I know that that's probably uh, stereotypical of me, but mm-hmm. I can say that because I'm a yeah. stereotypical person. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, there are 17,000 sides to every story, especially when we look back on uh, history of the blacks. So, uh, you know, but here, there's another one I'll, I'll give you. Um, the Scotch Irish would later be charged with provoking violence towards natives and specifically even friendly groups of natives. You might remember this name. Um, Cotton Mather would say in his book, Magnolia Christi Americana, which is like, I don't know, the blessings of America, something like that. Quote, the woods were almost cleared of thine pernicious creatures to make room for better growth and he's referencing how like the scott irish came through and um pushed all the natives out of the appalachia for the most part Mm. of course like any area of colonization there will be some outlier cases and from where from what i gather that's where appalachian lore really comes from a blend of belief from natives who were in the Appalachia some 16,000 years ago, Africans who escaped slavery showing up in the Appalachians with the natives dating back to as far as the 16th century, Hmm. the Scotch Irish and Germans, all cultures that have heavy beliefs in superstition, tradition, and myth. And what we now see in current day is all 25 26 million people of the Appalachia from all cultures being made vulnerable by the lack of infrastructure and support by the government. Appalachians struggle with food scarcity, unemployment, lack of social services, lack of education, healthcare disparities, and massive exploitation by outside corporations. The Appalachian Regional Committee, the ARC, was established in 1965 as a joint effort of 10 governors of the, of different Appalachian states seeking federal government assistance. Still, nearly 25% of the 420 counties in the region qualified as, quote, distressed, which is the ARC's lowest status of ranking. So we've just left them poor and forgotten. Yeah. Still in the modern yeah. age. Okay. Yes. Since the colonization of America, the Appalachian region has seen itself move forcibly to change. But the one thing that has never changed is its lore, fear, and respect of the Smoky Mountains. Hmm. Well, I'm glad that you laid down some of the uh, native background there, because we are definitely going to get into it a little bit later in the episode. But for now, I'm going to go to the way, way, way back machine. Let's do it. So, sculpted patiently over an awe-inspiring 480 million years ago, these rugged, stoic peaks stretching gracefully from Alabama all the way to Newfoundland stand as silent sentinels to epics gone by, recounting tales from the mist-enshrouded Ordovician period. I probably said that so wrong. It sounded time- right. Ordovician, maybe? Mm. A time so distant and unlike our own. When meandering through their tranquil valleys over ancient, enduring crests, every footstep resonates with echoes of bygone eras, as every rock and rill unfolds stories of primal seas and monumental geological shifts. But really, let's sprinkle a pinch of perspective on this antiquity, because even entities that we regard as ancient are mere fledglings compared to the 
actual Appalachian mountains age. The Atlantic Ocean, for example, was formed 200 million years ago, while dinosaurs, they came around 230 million years ago. The Himalayas, 50 million years ago. Flowering plants and mammals, 125 to 66 million years ago, while human, human civilization with our myriad of accomplishments, we're only about 10,000 years old. Even the most recent ice ages with their sweeping and dramatic alterations of the Earth's surface belong to the last 2.4 million years as geological yesterday in the age old tale of the Appalachians. All those things are younger than this mountain range. Sharks are younger than this mountain range. Damn. Saturn's fucking rings are younger than the Appalachian Mountains. That doesn't even make any sense, dude. Isn't that so wild? That's crazy. So when we are talking about this region, we're not just looking at mountains, but we're actually peering into pretty much an unfathomable amount of time. We are taking stories that essentially begin at the predecessor of eternity as far as Earth goes. And we're going to try to dissect them the best we can. So in the shadowy world of witchcraft and mystery, the old wise Appalachian mountains are seen as more than just hills and rock. They are wells of magical energy, holding the secrets and stories of countless lifetimes. Imagine walking in a place where you can almost feel the ghosts of the past whispering around you, a place where the spirits have seen such times and creatures we can only dream of. So in the Appalachians, these places hide secrets, powerful places where Big magic events have happened and become special spots for rituals and meditations. So picture invisible lines of strong energy called ley lines crossing Mm -hmm. through the land and making the mountains even more powerful and more magical. And the mountains themselves, being ancient, are often thought of as wise beings where people might connect and learn the unknown magical secrets of our time. The lush greenery and different plants are also thought to hold their own magic and and spells and potions of like Appalachian folklore tap into their power. And the idea of astral energy comes into play too, where such ancient spaces after so many years and so much history become linked together to other mysterious worlds, opening doors to different spiritual dimensions and making magic even stronger. The practice of ancestor magic, some of my favorite magic, and talking Mm -hmm. and working with long gone spirits also finds like a really rich home in this area. And then moreover, the mountains themselves have varied elements of like earth, water, fire, and air, which become the perfect stage for practicing magic related to these elements. And even though these ideas are more related to myths and beliefs rather than like more of the scientific fact we know and love, they do paint a lively imaginative picture of how people might relate to and understand the rolling ancient landscapes of places like the Appalachian Mountains. And with every whispered wind and rustling leaf, an ageless mystery lingers, ever inviting, ever elusive in the fluctuating expanses of these ancient hills. So whispers of weathered lore flutter through this area. And oftentimes that comes through in these bits of like old wives tales and regurgitated stories throughout the area. I couldn't find anything that was like, if you hear a whisper, no, you didn't. I, I have a few off the top of my head. That I thought were crazy. What ones did you hear? Um, Oh my god, what was it? If it's raining and the sun's out, I I swear to God, the devil is beating her wife. His his wife. His wife. Yes. What the fuck is that, girl? Bullshit. I heard that too. I didn't even put it in the episode. What does that mean? That the devil is beating his wife. No, I didn't put it in the fucking episode. That one stuck with me when she said that. I went, huh? What? That's a weird also, one. um, that dimples are like dimples on your face or on your like above your butt are uh yeah, like you how you have mm-hmm. are from uh the devil's heel. Fuck, I really have to work on that dimple. Yeah. So you didn't even push it that hard in. Also that you're supposed to like a baby's supposed to fall on their head before the year age of one. Oh, that happened to me. Yeah. I'm I fine. got one. I got one. Yeah. Um, I distinctly remember my sister dropping me right smack dab on the top of my head. It was like a fucking undertaker ending me, you know? I got that. Explains. Yeah. 
Well, apparently it should explain um, like good health and good fortune. There I don't was also think it one, explains that. And I know. I think it explains the opposite. Of that. Yeah, I know. It <laughs> explains why the top of my head is as flat as a fucking plate. So. Yeah, it, it explains why I still have a soft spot. The tectonic plates on my fucking skeleton never merged together. Yeah. Um, there was another one that was like um, to to like relock yourself after a black cat crosses your path. You're supposed to make three X's in the air with your finger. That's a good one to know. I didn't know that. Yeah. Hopefully that doesn't trigger your OCD. But um, yeah, so those are a few. <laughs> also, the like, don't whistle. Like, whistling in the woods of the Appalachia um, will call out to uh, creatures. I could not find that. That's TikTok lore. Um, it's actually a Wendigo lore. Um, I know that with um, skinwalkers, you shouldn't disturb the earth by digging. Yeah, it's like the same thing and how like uh, skinwalkers or wendigos can uh, mimic either you or someone you know. Um, So but again, you know, that just leans itself to me, the synchronicities uh, and the scary synchronicities, because you have these uh, these like natives in the Appalachian region on the other side of the country having the The same same, the same lore, the same experiences, the same rules as those on the West Coast. Fucking scary, dude. Some of the stuff that we talk about, like, in this episode remind me of, like, the things that we've talked about with, like, ancient civilizations that have just, like, in, like the ancient Lemurians and people of Mu who actually, like, buried a bunch of their shit in South America and in Oregon, for some reason, also pops up in this. And I'm like, the fuck? Yeah, dude. It's crazy. So, I'm about to list off some of this lore, and I'm curious if you've heard any of these. Some of them, Please. it's, like, obvious. Like, if your joints ache, it means rain's coming. Like, yeah. yeah but that that's arthritis. Um, where the plaintive call of a bobwhite seemingly prays for the heavens that a very hard rain is going to fall. I don't know what, what bobwhite is. Bob White? Why would you put that in there and not tell me what Bob that White, is? Bobwhite, he did Price is Right. Yeah, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> no, Bob it's, a, it's a quail. A bobwhite is a quail. Why would he put a fucking quail? Okay, so... Well, so if you hear the call of it, it means that it's praying for rain. Mm. Um, Farmers will glance anxiously at their corn, knowing that thick, constricting shucks whisper warnings of looming storms. Or where a morbid ritual unfolds that the slaying of a black snake and suspending it upon the fence with its belly open to the sun means that is like a good way for rain to come. Okay. Um, if rain drops, pepper the earth on a Monday, expect them to dance upon the soil for at least two more days that week. Heed the owls whose hoots from mountainous heights signal clear sky where their calls from the lowlands herald inclement weather. Count the okay. fogs in October for each one foretells a snow to come in the hibernating grasp of winter. In the realms of marriage, young girls who dream of future lovers might seek predictions by sleepily naming each bedpost after a potential suitor. That reminds me of the the Halloween love rituals. Yeah. They're like, some of this stuff seems like one and the same. Mm -hmm. I do like the brooming stuff, but if she she names each bedpost, though, whatever one she sees first upon awakening will be her lover. Wow. Um, If she sweeps a broom beneath her feet and it casts a shadow upon her marital prospects, um, there's a superstitious warning that she will never be wed. I mean, the broom always pops up. We just popped up in uh, Italian Italian folklore. folklore? Yeah. Um, Mm. Dreams are believed to be potent with prediction and powerful, especially in this region. Um, any haunting visits within a, within a dream by anybody who has b- departed mysteriously foretells the arrival of a letter. Hmm. However, dreams that um, where you're birthed in an unfamiliar bed are whispered to carry the seed of truth and are destined to blossom into reality. Oh, my God. We're going to have so many apocalypses then. <laughs> um, I have some. I found like more. I mean, not really morbid but um god what was it i'm trying to i but there's like some that we i feel like we know like 
um, holding your breath when you pass a set, like a cemetery Mm -hmm. or crossing a bridge, like threshold places that signify a movement or yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, um, if a pregnant woman sees a dead person, her baby will have a birthmark. Oh, that's fun. Isn't that a fun one? Um, gosh, what was, there was another weird one about, well, I mean, the clocks, the stopping clocks and covering mirrors, that's another one that pops up. And we've seen that pop up yeah. in uh, Victorian lore. This one actually, um, to go even a little bit further, there isn't a clock one that I have written down somewhere. Oh, clocks need to be stopped the moment somebody dies to ward off further misfortune. Mm hmm. Um, there's also that you have to don the right sock on the and shoe first. These are just some of the superstitions. Oh, I can't do that naturally. I don't, I have to do, it's like against my ascension. So I'm fucked. (laughs) Um, That if you see a bluebird or if you look over your left shoulder and see a new moon, or if you find a red ear of corn, a pin or a heads up penny, To secure to the right shoe, it means that there will be a um, thread of your life that will become intertwined with death. Oh, my God. Jesus. (laughs) Um, That there is a belief that death seeks company in terms of threes. I feel like I've heard that before. Yeah, that one's one's pretty popular. Yeah. Um, If you hear an owl screech at dusk, it will – you're going to face impending doom. Um. Pregnant women need to guard their unborn from the marking gaze of the deceased. That's kind of like what you said. They'll get a birthmark. Mm -hmm. Um, There's also the simple act of an empty rocking chair that they set in motion to talk about, like, passing from one world to the next. I saw one that was like, um, if you leave a rocking chair rocking after you've gotten up out of it, a spirit will sit in it. Um, Some of these are like, if you hear bees then they're carrying the news of death throughout the mountain region. You know, Um, I actually heard that one recently because someone was talking about it. Um, They say, Oh my God, they were saying like the bees carry the gossip and uh, it's like a known no, like it's a known nomenclature in England. And I know, I don't know what that means, Um, but they take it so literally that like even the Royal like house has a bee colony and so there was a headline that said the royal bees have been told of the queen's passing. That is insane. Like literally. So that's wild. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they sense it. Yeah. I don't, I mean, apparently that's another synchronicity. Um, I have one. I found, I love one. This one, Jesus took me a while to say that because it's another one we use all the time. It's pour one out. Pour a, uh, pour a pour strong drink on the ground for the spirits of past. Pour one out. Um, and then my personal favorite, spit on a new baby to bring it good luck. <laughs> Get <laughs> fucked. Yeah. Um, let's see here. There's some different things that you can do that will have good luck. Um, so, or to like ways to not tempt fate. So if you don't want bad luck, you should always exit a building through the same door of which you entered. Hmm. Um, you should always ensure an apple remains upon the tree as a silent sentinel against devilish attention. Um, sprinkling salt over the left shoulder. We've heard that one before. It yep. keeps demonic presence away. Um, and a modest offering of spirits, aka alcohol, liquor, spilled upon the ground honors ghosts of the past, pouring one out. Yeah, pour one out. Um, when it's the new year, you should open up your doors so that a fresh new breeze can come through your house, so that the old weary year can be gently guided out, and then like a new year can be, you know, yeah, that's Safely that kind of. In. I also hear of uh, sweeping out your door, like sweeping your entire house, and then like actually physically with a broom sweeping it out your door on the new year. Yeah, I've heard that on New Year's and on um, new moons that you're supposed to like sweep yeah. out your house. Yep. So that's some of like the lore and the myth, and that stuff's always fun to me. But now we're going to get into the bread and butter of what I personally really like which are the creatures of dark myth and unspeakable horror 
that find their homes and their residents in the Appalachian Mountains. Oh, yeah. So we're going to kind of go on a, a really quick journey through some of these different things that are said to haunt there. If any of these kind of strike somebody's fancy, I would love to do a full episode about some of these. Um, but let's start from the top down. I'm going to go from what I thought was kind of the most disturbing to the least just dis- or mm-hmm. least disturbing to most disturbing. Oh, okay. On opposite. <laughs> so first in Pleasance County, West Virginia, their whispers of the wampus beast, a formidable gigantic feline creature shrouded in a night black fur that seems to absorb all semblance of light. It's presence heralded by a wretched stench, a combination of a wet dog and a skunk It is a nocturnal predator, which overshadows male mountain lions fourfold, and it instills a subtle, ever-present unease amongst locals who dare to wander alone in the dark. Have you heard of the word wumpus before? I feel like I've heard that before. Yeah, I feel like it's one of the houses in the American Harry Potter. What? Yeah, wumpus house. So there's the, you have Hogwarts, which is like the England School of Wizardry, and then you have uh, I- Ilvermorny, which is the American one, and Wampus is one of the fucking houses. Oh, that's where it must have come from. There's no other explanation. <laughs> um, that's the only th- reason why I knew it, uh, because I think I got sorted into the Wampus house when it first came out, and I was devastated. Womp, womp, it was a fucking womp. cat house. I was so yep. bummed. Oh, God. Yeah, that is upsetting. Yeah, I was like, cats? Also, like the name Wumpus, it's so crusty. It's not very threatening. Yeah, yeah, it's not threatening. Anyway, um, the next one is the bipedal wolf man of Wolf County, Kentucky. Its tales have been woven into the local narrative since the 1970s, and it haunts dreams with its seven foot stature and unusual fur, reminiscent of something that you would see between a bear and a gorilla. Oh, so not like a wolf at all. <laughs> it's the well, that's just it's. That's just its fur, <laughs> but it's an embodiment of primal fear, and its howls echo through the dark hollows of secluded caves, forever interwoven in the nightmares of those who have witnessed it. On a similar level, you also have the malevolent smoke wolf, which has eyes of flame with uh, that are red, and it casts an ominous shadow. And accounts of its reign of terror are reluctantly shared in hushed tones by those who have heard its gut tr- gut wrenching howls and screams in the night. And it reveals a propensity for killing, not out of need, but for what people assume to be more of a sadistic pleasure. Yet it bears a curious dread of rattling chains and a small, um, which is kind of like, I don't know. That would be fun. That's like, right? Like, it's like opposite opposite Krampus. Whereas like Krampus is like, you know, jiggling chains. This one, it's like you jiggle a chain and he's like oh no i won't eat you yes and then the last one before we get to the big bad is the grafton monster which is supposedly a headless bipedal behemoth it has very broad shoulders shrouded in a coat of fur and witness accounts from the 1950s onward reveal an entity with like formidable weight of about a thousand pounds and it haunts the vicinity and it has a massive form which stalks livestock in an unsettling and silent demeanor. Now, I kind of looped all those together because they're all similar enough. Like, with the exception of the wampus cat, they're all mm-hmm. f- kind of, I mean, they're, they're all like furry animalistic They're like entities. werewolves. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, a, a bobcat, werewolf things like that. And while those things are very fun to me, I wouldn't put them in a spooktober category of being particularly disturbing. I think that they're fun. I think that they belong more along the lines of like what Bigfoot is, which is something that's like more interesting to talk about and fun to discover. But I don't think that that's really what's haunting the region that would make it fucking Mm -hmm. creepy. Um, This one And I'm so glad. Remember I said I was so glad you talked about Cherokee legend because we're Mm -hmm. getting into the most terrifying one of the whole kit and caboodle, which is called the Raven Mocker. It is the epitome of malevolence from Cherokee legend, and it casts an impenetrable shadow over southwest Virginia with black fur and hollow eyes, which shapeshift ominously against the unknowing. Silently, it feasts on human hearts breaking the sacred bonds of trust within communities and leaves no trace of its horrifying intimacy. 
Transmitted through generations, the terrifying encounters with these spectral beings narrate a consistent tale. As an individual nears death, their spirit is seized by the raven mocker, and their heart is silently consumed. Bound by taboo, families stifle their fears and suspicions while they wait for adept medicine men to wage secret spiritual war against these entities, shielding the souls of the perishing from their frightful destiny. And the reason why it's so taboo is because one of the most taboo things that you can do to as a human is to fucking eat another human. Mm -hmm. And they want to avoid that kind of ickiness that comes in with a death because it's not a good death. And for something to take over and essentially consume itself is akin to like a suicide, right? Like very Mm -hmm. big taboo type of things. So this Raven mocker is thought to have descended from the cosmos when you have the combination of like the chilling cry of a Raven with the visual semblance of a shooting star With this, you get an entity shrouded in ancient evil, which transcends this earthly pine and becomes a a spectral being, uh, being, ineffable even to the darkest entities of the supernatural realm. Realm. I'm fucking sure. Let me have a beer. (laughs) Take a little sippy sip. Man, I can feel myself sobering up. Also, that's not a beer. That's a busy. Don't lie. It's a busy, you're right. So its life extends into an unnerving agelessness, perpetuating through the consumption of human hearts and casting an insidious shadow over trust within communities as it cloaks its malevolence beneath the guise of fragile elderly humans. This is where you kind of get into people being like fucking scared. You get like the Salem witchcraft trial type stuff, right? Where everyone starts yeah. getting accused and you just quite can't, you can't quite tell. Um, so when you get to these ancient areas in the Eastern United States, you may notice that doors are locked and the dying are vigilantly guarded. They are safeguarded against the unseen, insatiable dark entities that lurk just beyond our understanding, and their tales are whispered through generations as a spectral warning echoing through the Appalachian shadows. And what's wild is that even though we have this extensive list of cryptids that are probably in the area, we still have like a ton of other encounters that cannot be explained. So these are things where some of these cryptid looking things pop up, but they don't quite fit into this category of like the cryptids or um we're usually we're good about not calling um things that come from like native american lore cryptids like this Mm -hmm. is a raven mocker it is completely different and distinct from what a cryptid is this is Mm -hmm. like a actual spiritual being that exists within the culture yeah so the first one that we're going to come on across is the deadly town village cursed with madness story so Dudley Town, forever scarred by Edmund Dudley's dark history, became known as the Village of the Damned. Tales tell of terrific um, and horrific happenings <laughs> and of, <laughs> of residents actually being tortured by unseen forces. They lost their sanity, and that would usually end with them taking their own lives. Shadows even now creep along the ancient ruins, and phantom lights flicker through the eerie, forsaken landscape. It is said that the curse still pervades binding restless spirits with this unhallowed ground. Next we have apparitions. Has anyone come out and said like that the madness was from some, like, what do they say? The water was bad. (laughs) There was like lead in the paint. The, you know, like, do you remember that one? There was like the, the dancing curse, right. In, in Europe, you know, Oh, hysteria, like shared, um, hallucinations or whatever. Yeah. Couldn't find it. In fact, a lot of this stuff is kind of like the most I was able to find. So we're kind of going to shoot through some of these stories fairly quickly. But um, it kind of just like these stories do deserve their own episodes. But since they tie into the overall episode of the Appalachians, like this is where we get the fun, scary stuff of the mountains. Mm. Um, So there are also apparitions in the trees. Specifically, there was an apparition of a sorrowful man, which was witnessed by a girl and her mom. And this one kind of transcends a mere spooky sighting because his sadness seemed to leak into the atmosphere like a fucking dementor. He chilled the air and warped the reality around him. And as he dissipated, the fearful tension actually lingered and the manifestation of a tragic tale went beyond his death and people felt kind of like tethered to cruel earthly demises for the rest of their lives after seeing it. Um, There are bloodstained grounds, specifically in Maryland, 
the Appalachian Mountain Trail is stalked by the lost souls of Civil War soldiers, uh, specters compelled to reenact their perpetual violent demise. Phantom campfires, detached voices, and ethereal cannons pervade the land. The well, where the bodies of 58 soldiers were disposed of, now purportedly serves as a vortex where their unrestful spirits arise, forever bound to their horrific fate. I think it was an episode of, unfortunately, uh, Ghost Adventures. And I think that was the only episode that I was like, wait a minute. And I'm pretty sure it was the episode where they went on to like battlegrounds of the Civil War. And you could see like, you know how they use that little like fucking Xbox tracking. Yeah. You know, and it puts the little stick figures up. Yeah. And you could like see it like clearly uh, people walking in formation. That's crazy. I know. Some of those, like, Whoa. some of the stick figure things where they look like it's just like bopping in a rave. I'm like, oh, whatever. But they had one the other day that I watched where it looked like something was like scuttling across the ceiling, and that gave me a. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah, that would be so cool to be able to go there and do some like ghost hunting. I wonder if it's just saturated with nerds though. It probably is. Like fucking Zach Biggins. <sighs> we can't go there. Next, we have a predator of innocence called Spearfinger. And she, with her bewitching, malevolent essence, preys upon the innocent, isolating them from safety and exploiting their vulnerability. Her ghastly feast upon the livers of children unfolds in a spectacle of morbid fascination and inexhaustible malevolence. And her spectral presence um, forever tarnishes the serene peaks of the Smoky Mountains. Next this week, is like a typical... Uh, God, what, yeah, like witch. What's that little children's story? Hansel and Gretel. Yeah. Hansel and Gretel. That's what I meant. Um, um, next, we have Pierce Pond. And there were actually two encounter- encounters with an eerie apparition besides Pierce Pond. And they weren't just unexpected sights for a lone hiker. Um, but it was often people in the area would find an ominous intrusion into the natural realm. So this specter had a cold, distant gaze. And its inexplicable appearances invoked yet another aura of impending doom, urging men into going into frantic, unrelenting flights from an unseen terror. Okay, slay. Next, we have the Phantom Passage with misplaced spirits. So there's a looming phantom that appeared before a hiker in 1972, garbed in time-worn attire and permeated an intense, impenetrable sorrow. We have a bit of a theme here. Mm-hmm. And he offered an enigmatic glimpse into a long forgotten life. His mysterious disappearance into the fog left behind an unsettling stillness and a tangible connection to a spectral reality just beyond human understanding. He left the people who saw him forever unchanged, kind of like the little boy in Sixth Sense. Um, other hikers have seen a that. surreal <laughs> emergence of children. And their off-kilter laughter from a persistent mist transcended anything that they <laughs> like, could understand. Um, their disembodied giggles reverberated through the trail long after their departure, which was like kind of an unwelcome reminder and suggestive of an, an alternate parallel universe to our own. Also, um, I don't ever want to hear children laughing, especially if it's from a fucking mist. Like disembodied giggles? Yeah. yeah that could be no like thanks. the worst band name. We need to text that to Taylor. Disembodied giggles. <laughs> um, there's also a hiker who is abducted by unidentified figures after witnessing an unexplained luminous phenomena in the adjacent forest. He endured an ordeal of pain and terror at the hands of these unseen assailants. And his he actually escaped like mere moments before a potentially fatal uh, accumulation of this torture. And his fate forever became entwined with kind of like a dark unresolved mystery that still whispers to the trees of the Appalachian trails. There's also a young couple who are pursued and tormented by enigmatic figures who found themselves engulfed by an overpowering paranoid fear. They're seemingly ever present observers emerging from darkness to taunt and terrify cast a perpetual shadow upon their journey. And that actually suggested that they had, that they had taken an interest in these people. Um, and they were consistently hit, like tortured throughout their lives by like kind of the presence of the unseen. Mm. Another one is a lady named Geraldine Largay, who experienced a unexplained disappearance on the Appalachian Trail. Um, and this one actually has 24 people go missing on it annually. Damn. And 
she is a little bit more unique in the sense because she was actually found only a half hour away from a viable route. And this we talked a little bit about in the Missing 411 episode, but it's like yeah. the fact that there is an uncanny ability of these Appalachian trails to not only disorient, but to conceal people away, um, especially in search parties. Like 30 minutes is not that far, and it's definitely within the expanse of a search party. Easy. Uh, yeah, exactly. This one was fun because it popped up in a – so a lot of these were like – one offs that I found on different websites, but this one came up a few times and it's the endless torment of the burned soul. So this one talks about a man who is horrifically burned and uh, kind of terrorizes hikers in the area, but he also communicates kind of a timeless suffering. And he hints at like at this by showing the landscape around him also burned and his mysterious agonizing existence is kind of eerily juxtaposed with the fresh tragedy of like showing incinerated homes. And he also mm -hmm. makes people feel an extreme link to um, pain and death. And after he appears to people at first, um, hikers will often find themselves kind of entranced by the idea of a burned soul. Specifically one hiker talks about how he could no longer sleep um, and when he did sleep, he had nightmares of fire, destruction, and an internal echo of tormented whales. And his days, which were once brimming with purpose and solitude, were now tainted with a pervasive dread that seemed to ooze from the gnarled trees and mislaid and paths that he now saw everywhere. So as this hiker delved into the history of the scorched man, stories of a family home consumed by fires, of lost lives and spirits bound by anguish, emerged from the shadow corners of local lore. The man, the burned man, once a loving father and husband, was said to have been devoured by the cruel flames alongside his kin, and then that caused his spirit to be forever imprisoned in a loop of anguish and grief. But the enigma of the Scorch Man actually bears another layer. It was actually whispered that his soul was blackened by the ferocious inferno that had stolen everything from him. So he got locked into kind of like the ring where you see the video and you have to pass it mm -hmm. on. So he was constantly causing cycles of vengeance and despair. And so just seeing his apparition, it said, is a manifestation of a potent curse born of his pain, which is destined to reach across all time. Like it's one of those curses where like, we don't know how to fucking yeah. break it. Yeah. So anyone who goes into his domain will see like smoke, they'll see like fire. Um, and then you're just fucking haunted forever. So. Did I ever tell you about my reoccurring childhood dream about uh, the man on fire? No, tell me. Um, so of course my child brain couldn't come up with anything more creative than the fireman which is what i would refer to him as i had these vivid reoccurring dreams during childhood probably like five six seven maybe years old where i would be running from a man who was engulfed in flame top to bottom like his whole you could only see like a shadow of what his body was and it was like one of those classic dreams where you're trying to run, but you're like going slow. Mm -hmm. And even the area like of the dream was like hellfire. It was like biblical damnation. It was like cracked crevices and like almost cliff sides, but everything was on fire. That's and terrifying. he was chasing me. Um I looked up what it means to dream about a burning person or to be running from a burning person. And it's super boring. So I don't really want to spoil that for you, but I feel like I now have to say it. What is it? Um, running away. Okay. So the burning man indicates mm -hmm. that you have a desire for change or purification, but are also at the age of, of five. <laughs> yeah. But are also afraid of the consequences of letting go of the past. Um, that's super boring. I like it how it could be a spiritual warning to guard you against taking a financial risk at the age of five. Yeah, you know, um, those risks. That's really interesting, though, because fire is one of those things that lives like tangentially. Like it's 
the ultimate destruction and it also symbolizes like hell or impurity or like where bad stuff goes. But then on the flippity flip, it is like that purification and that cleansing. Mm -hmm. So the Mm -hmm. fact that you were so little though, like little kids have such like a liminal like experience in this world where they can like see shit that we don't. So I wonder like if you had some spiritual torment going on or something. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows what that was? Cause I can't even think of like anything that would have suggested to my moldable little brain to come up with that yeah um i definitely had reoccurring dreams uh where i would like i grew up on the second or my bedroom growing up was on the second floor and a man would just be outside my window even though there was no way for him to get up there but he would like be i would like wake up and sit up in my bed and i would see him in the cornfield like miles away and i would like blink and then he would all of a sudden like be outside Ooh, that's a spooky one creepy right very spooky Um, I actually have that dream. I don't know. Some of the reoccurring dreams from my childhood, like, are also dreams that I have now where it's just understood that it's a continuation of it. You still have that dream? Yeah, I have that dream. Um, I'm trying to think of like another crazy one I have. I actually started creepy, uh, keeping a dream journal because some of my dreams were starting to get like out of hand where they were kind of like fucking me up bad. Because most of my dreams are terrible. Um, But the Mm -hmm. ones that are fun are fun. Um, But I often have dreams of just like of floods happening when I'm like in a paradise area. And those I've had pretty much my whole life. And I actually had another one of those. I remember distinctly in elementary school having my mom write down my dream of this flood. And then the last flood dream I had was actually 10-11. Wow. Look at that. You really fill that bitch out. Yeah. yeah, I know. It even makes you like feel. This is another dream. Oh Those are corpses. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Oh, oh, that's really good, Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's crazy. But it's like I, I do think that like dreams. It's actually would be a cool episode to do an episode about dreams because I feel like they can also they can on one level be your brain trying to process what you've been through throughout the day. But there's got to be something so much more because that's something that we haven't tapped into. It's like the bottom of the ocean, man. What kind of megalodon is swimming around in my brain? Well, I think that's exactly it. I think like it's um, like subconscious stuff. Um, I also, my friend Cass, she has dreams where she knows she's dreaming. And I'm like, I heard that if you have dreams like that, you're supposed to like tell yourself like in the dream, like say out loud, like I'm dreaming and people experience everyone in the dream, like stopping and staring at them. Dude, like that's, inception. Uh, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to point out the reality of the dream. You're not supposed to tell other people within your dreams that it's a dream. And you're also not supposed to like take suggestions from people in dreams because Why? it's like a sinister force. Dude, it's the same thing as like putting a welcome mat down on your door. It like invites shit in or it's like, signing into a a Ouija board and not signing the fuck out. Like, um, that's a no, no. Like you can Hmm. subconsciously be like, Oh, I'm in a dream and I am going to start flying around my room or whatever. But to interact with like other entities in the dream is a no, no, because those exist somewhere that we don't want to give them an open door of interacting with us because it could make you into a gateway. Well, let's find out, you know, um, I will say that probably the shittiest, scariest dreams I had growing up that came to fruition, and now I'm terrified of my dreams, was I would dream that my mom and my sister Jess would die all the time. That's fucking terrible. I know. So now if I, like, dream that somebody dies, I'm like... Yeah, I'm you're to, like crazy. Visit. It triggers my OCD so bad because I try to, like, snap the fuck out of that so that they don't come true, which is also Mm -hmm. an idea of OCD where you think that you can have powers and you you can only do your rituals to prevent them. (laughs) God, that medication needs to be upgraded. I know. Um, Listen to it. I not working. Oh my God. Yeah. (laughs) That's the sound of a lot of money down the Uh drain, not working. Um, You want to know dreams that I have all the time since we're now talking about dreams. Yeah. Um, I, my worst nightmares lately and this, this is so fucking pathetic because I've had nightmares even recently about like the apocalypse and the end of the world. And I feel like I told you about my super vivid UFO, um, yeah. like attack dream. The ones that make me wake up with heart pounding anxiety, feeling upset 
are just dreams where my partner is ignoring me. Like, Chelsea, I will wake up fucking raging with anger because I had just woken up from a dream where I was like, hey, are we still going to this? Red. Hey, just want to see if we're going to this? Red. Hey, it's been three hours. Red. I will wake up and be like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I, I can like, relate that with that. Is, that's my worst dream. So some of my worst dreams, and these happen all the time, is yes. I will dream that will Oliver, he will break up with me in my dream. And mm-hmm. then I have to re-download dating apps. <laughs> but they've changed so much oh that they're just so massively inconvenient. Mm-hmm. And I'm like in the app trying to like fucking meet up with people but yeah. like the app is outside of the semblance of any understanding that this old crusty lizard brain can understand but the <laughs> dread you fucking felt it and i know yeah. other people have felt it out there where you like put the bottle down and mm-hmm. you're like fuck i have yeah. to re-download tinder because mm-hmm. this piece of shit wasted my fucking time yeah that's the tea girl Yep. That's the fucking tea girl. Yep. So uh I yeah, I I have the dream of being ignored or like um him being rude to me in public. Um oh, or that dismissing one's the worst. Oh, it drives me fucking crazy. Ah! Oh, I I will and like I will wake up at fucking three in the morning because I'll I'll literally have dreams of being kidnapped and running for my life in a torture house. And I'm like hey, yeah, through the you're dream. Fine. The dream where Ty is ignoring me in public, my body's rage will wake me out of a dead slumber, like yeah. like fucking Undertaker. I wake yeah. up like, <laughs> and I just yeah. grab my phone. I grab my phone and I'm like, like the yeah, like, typing out the world's longest like paragraph to him, like, oh, guess what? I just fucking dreamed yeah. about. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not my problem. It becomes your problem the second yeah. I wake up. Um, yeah, it's an issue. Like all I, I have dreams sometimes where I go to Lagoon and I'm naked and I have to win a stuffed animal to form an outfit. <laughs> Not that bad. Oliver will be like, hey, he'll like shrug, shrug me off of him in a dream. And I am devastated <laughs> for days. I'm fucking, I am fucked up. And I'll be like, I'll text him. I'm like, you were mean to me in my dream last night. And he's like, he's like, oh, why would you dream that? I love you. And I'm like, you know, son of a bitch like this is your problem you fix it i could probably search on my phone right now you were mean to me in my dream and it would probably come up like a hundred fucking times the the brushing you off like off like you literally go to grab them i have had that in my fucking dreams so many times i lose it i'm so glad i don't have like one of the little heart rate monitor watches like you have because the the beeping noise would probably wake me up oh, yeah. before my body's natural anger wakes me up oh uh, and like <laughs> i'll i'll send him a message on instagram because i know he doesn't have instagram notifications turned on but he has i like messages like text messages so i'll do the kindness of like i'm gonna send him these 17 paragraphs on instagram so i don't wake him up mm-hmm. but then i just like sit there and like look and i'm like Oh, I'm this motherfucker. I am. (laughs) See, it's crazy. Such a cow. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, uh, And it's crazy because then I'm like, I'm so annoying to you all fucking day for things that are outside of your control. I can't possibly understand why I would be insecure about you ever being mean to me when I'm such an asshole all the time. Yeah. Um, But it is what it is. Yep. Yep. So, um, even though I... (laughs) I searched mean to me in my dream. And the first thing that popped up was from Ty saying that he had a dream that I dated Batman. Oh, that's <laughs> tight. That oh, is actually that's cool. Cool, actually. Anyway, so that's about dreams. <laughs> I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, this is a- so. I got nothing from Appalachia, but I got so much from Dream Talk. We're going to have to go back into dreams. I think. We just like do that. We we're gonna have to start diving into what dreams mean. Um, I think we should start interviewing the people around us if they've had any reoccurring childhood dreams, like how we had. We should do a call for like I'll post it on our Instagram right now. 
send yeah. us your fucked up dream stories. Also, everyone listening right now, send us your fucked up dream stories. Yeah. Um, DM it to us on Instagram at go to hell podcast or on Twitter at go to hell podcast. Um, or you can email it to us if you don't have social media. And that is Chelsea and Noel go to hell at gmail.com. Perfect. Send it, send it to us. I want to hear your spooky dreams or you just have like bad dreams. Um, like what you, it doesn't even have to be reoccurring. It could just be like, Oh, I have this, I had this bad dream. Like tell us your worst dreams. That's what I want to know. I don't even know if I'll share my worst dreams. I'll text it to you in private, but <laughs> you have to share one. Okay. I will on the next episode. Yeah, you have to. I'll share one of my really bad ones, even though like for me personally, as we've said um, just now, my worst dreams that affect me are just um, Ty being mean to me yeah. or ignoring my text messages or physically bumping my hand off of his shoulder or, or dreams where Oliver gets a cat. I'm like, why would you do that to me? Now I have to go. Just insincere. That's him. That's him silent quitting. <laughs> <laughs> that is him silent quitting. Oh, uh, fucking God. So anyway, that's Appalachia, baby. <laughs> there you go. You know what the Appalachian mountain range did give us? It gave us this key, which unlocked our true passion, which is dreams. Sleeping. Yes. And sleeping. Um, I'm going to have to, I, I think I've been taking a sleep aid lately that doesn't let me dream as much as I used to, but, um, I, so I'll knock that off for science for the next like two weeks. Um, I need to actually take something to sleep so I can fall asleep. Should I, I think start I'll taking sleep melatonin tonight? again and just have crazy dreams? Dude, let's do melatonin and just go raw dog in our nightmares. Dude. Yeah. God, isn't that doesn't that suck? That's the universal experience of melatonin. For me, it doesn't even help me sleep. It just makes me have fucking night yeah. terrors. All right, I'll it's start taking just... melatonin tonight. Okay, let's do it. I'll I'll take some. Actually, I'm scared to take it tonight. Let me take it when I'm not at home alone. Yeah, <laughs> I feel you. I I'll feel you. do it this weekend or something. But oh man, speaking of um, nightmares, you can uh, cure your nightmares by going to the link in any of our bios i'm at noelle fane that's at sid lord we are at go to hell podcast and in that link in our bios you can find a link tree and that will take you to a plethora of things one of them being our patreon a dollar gets you in which is super appreciated we love you pieces um wait what that's a secret Oh my fucking god, you <laughs> bitch. Noelle and I communicate yeah, while we talk you... on podcasts. I just want everyone to know. <laughs> also, we will communicate on like two different forms of chat. Yeah. Like we'll talk in the chat of the video and then we'll talk on Slack and yeah. it's crazy. So anyway, anyway, yeah. um, any fucking way. Now that distracted me. Why did you do that in my monologue? No, no. That's on you. God. Anyway, I'm gonna not look at it. Um. So there, Patreon dollar gets you in. We have new episodes every week. Um. This episode was fun. Um. We gave some recommendations for you to watch. Um. Take a listen. A dollar gets you in. We also have all of our panels uploaded on there for free. Yeah. In that, if you remember what I mentioned before, that link tree in our bios, you can also find a link to. Kelly Holloran or at Wild Waddell on Etsy. She makes cool shit for us and she makes cool shit in general. We also have a link to our merch, which Chelsea is pumping merch out like it's fucking going out of style. Um, we, of course, have our L. Ron Hubbard merch, which is super fun. It's my favorite um, so far, yeah. Yeah, why go clear when you can go queer, which is a great question if you actually want to ask that yourself. Ask yourself of that. Jesus. Um, 100% of proceeds are donated from that. Yeah, we don't take a single cent from nope. any of that. So if you nope. ever want a design, just for the love of the game, maybe you want to print it on a poster of which our merch store doesn't offer, just set us up and we'll send it to you. Yeah, straight up. Um, we also have a link to our discord server, um, a link to our Facebook group for the boomers and a link to listen to us anywhere podcasts are heard. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, let's see. I'm 
I might not see you guys until I'm 31. So if I make it by then, if I make it by then, um, I'm feeling old, but I'm going to say, um, hail your thirties. Hail. First of all, hail Satan, obviously the only reason why I'm in my thirties, hail Satan, but I'm also going to say, um, hail your thirties because I, my twenties were miserable and I thought I was doing it wrong because everyone else seemed to love it. And then I, hit 30 and i was like oh just kidding this is just it this is where life actually starts yeah so uh hail your 30s hail this tasty ocd medicine that's doing nothing except if i don't take it i get the brain zaps so thank you psychiatry yeah you gotta love it you know i you know we say if you stop taking it you would just get the brain zaps but i have a feeling if you stopped taking it you would become ins- insufferable. We would have to call your fucking school, your school helper. Yeah. You'd have to dart th- me. Yeah, you'd have to shoot a, a dart directly into my fucking aorta. So we'd have to call that lady who would sit at the lunch table with Sue! you after you swallowed your food. Sue, <laughs> <call> yeah. <laughs> She's like, I've been retired for twenty years. We're like, you're coming out for Oh yeah, seriously. Oh man, but. So anyway, keep taking that. So. <laughs> okay, I'll do. I'll try. Yeah, I, I kind of have to, so I will. Yeah. Okay, <sighs> thanks. Um, let's right. get the fuck out of here. All right, bye. Bye.